guys, I'm a. I'm. A <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Ayla. <laughs> I'm Andy. <laughs> and I'm not Andy. I'm Ayla. <laughs> and welcome to Sinister Dynasty. Our first case that we're going to be talking about is. Stanley Graham and the mass shooting in Kokotai, New Zealand. Maybe it's Kaurangi, New Zealand. I have no idea. Hokitika, New Zealand. <laughs> You'd think we'd know this since we're from this country. <laughs> You'd think. Oh, well. Right, ready? Yes. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Eric's... <laughs> Eric Stanley George Graham, known as Stan, was born in Cockatoo, New Zealand, on the twelfth of November, nineteen hundred. There was yeah, there was quite a bit ago, eh? Like the nineteen hundreds, <laughs> but all good. I wonder if they no. Carry on. I'll let you finish, and then I'll go. <laughs> born to Mary Graham and John Graham, who was a proprietor of the Long Longford Hotel. What's that, a proprietor? An owner. Okay. <laughs> Please speak basic bitch terms. No, no, keep asking questions. Okay. That's good. Of the Longford Hotel that was built in 1902. Mm. Stan worked at this hotel from a child with his two other siblings, a brother and sister. He attended school in Cockatoo, where he was described as slightly reserved but fairly well behaved. Okay, stop there. I reckon they've all got that kind of background to them, eh? Like the quite well reserved but well behaved and you just never expect them to be yeah like a as he grew into adulthood he was less than five foot six inches tall oh that's a reason there <laughs> 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 that'd be our height wouldn't it Were we nah we're i'm we're five eight i think just no we're we... not oh I've, i don't know how tall no i'd say that we're five five six five six oh maybe oh no i'll have to google yeah Okay, yeah, okay. so it is yeah. five foot. Yeah, a little bit shorter yeah. than us. Okay, well, that's not so much of a reason then. I don't really plan on <laughs> grabbing a gun and killing people. <laughs> Plot twist. <laughs> Plot twist. <laughs> Making the podcast to see <laughs> so I can be featured on it later. <laughs> uh, as he grew into adulthood, he was less than five foot six mm. inches tall. He was a stocky build. Stocky. Okay. Throughout his years, he enjoyed many sports, boxing, wood chopping, shooting, and later cockfighting. Oh, shooting, that's one of the things there. <laughs> oh god, this podcast is going to be so insensitive. <laughs> red flag. Oh good, a red flag. <laughs> um, <laughs> it just, yeah. He was an active member of the Cockatoo Gun Club from the late 1920 through to the early 1930s. Mm. In the late 1920s, Dorothy McCoy, Doc, moved to Rakaia to work at the Longford Hotel. This is where Stan met her. Mm. Wait, so it was kind of like a love story, like a Romeo and Juliet kind of vibe. Um, well, they end up dead, right? So that's kind of like Romeo and Juliet You would just have vibe. to wait. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Stan and Dorothy were married on the 22nd of the 12th, 1930 in Christchurch. After six months, they returned to Kaurangi to run a small dairy farm. From this came their son and daughter. Mm. Mm. In the late 1930s, Stan had a neighbourly relationship with his community, but his wife Dot was not in social. They did not attend the local social nights, which include dances, right. with the community. Mm. Red flag. Yeah, I was like, I wonder, because the communities back then, they always did stuff together, eh? Yeah. It's little old New Zealand, so <laughs> everyone's kind of no I, I mean, like, <laughs> when the pub down the road's open, we don't go. And that's only open every once in a blue moon. When the Great Depression began in 1929, Stan became under immense financial hardship. Mm. The Westland Dairy Co-op found some of Stan's cream to be unhygienic and would return it dyed blue, which resulted in loss of income. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't know why they did this. It could be so they couldn't resell it elsewhere well, or, or they didn't try and send it back. What well, is like pretty, what, 1920s, 1930s? Yeah. A bit wacky, <laughs> a bit different. Yeah, to I couldn't in. find anything that said that people die there, why they dyed the milk blue. Mm. 
but yeah, it's obviously for a reason. Just funky, you like flavoured milk. <laughs> blue cheese milk, <laughs> yum. <laughs> Maybe that's what they turn blue cheese on, to make mm. blue cheese from. Mm. I'm pretty sure they don't, but no. <laughs> um. Um, with debt also occurring from cattle breedings, Stan's debt would have been totaling more than £550, approximately $59,701.76 as today. Okay, yeah, that's a lot of debt. It would have been back then. I mean, our dairy farmers are like 10 grand plus in debt. <laughs> yeah, that's true. 10 grand, 10 grand isn't much. I mean, like well, then that's, hundreds that's of six, thousands. That, yeah, that's six, oh. <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars okay. in debt. Right. To with today's farming. Okay. Oh, so you're saying that today's farmers could you have got it way worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna say what actually. Oh, we never got we're never gonna run out of episodes, are we, <laughs> if that's true. <laughs> As a result of this, the bank were after his money and we're looking to claim on their farm, their home and their land. All I can think of is like Mr. Krabs and like his <laughs> money, 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 me. <laughs> But most banks are like <laughs> Yeah. Stan's neighbour, William Jameson, who is also a member of the Dairy Company's Board of Directors, who was aware of Stan's decline and his cream commented, in himself, he was different. I thought he might have been slipping mentally. Mm. Yeah, let's hold on to Tell that thought. Signs. That'll come back soon. Yeah. Throughout this time, Stan and Dot struggled with the health of their cattle. From this... Came Stan and Dot accusing their neighbours and community of poisoning their stock. The accusations ranged from words to fistfights to Stan pointing a gun at a neighbour. This continued with their paranoia increasing and withdrawing themselves further from their community. They would target anyone walking past their home. Okay, yeah, so again, that's just big signs that they should have been locked away somewhere, probably. I mean, it's down the road from. The Seaview Asylum. Where's that? Mental Asylum in Hokitika. Oh, guys, we'll be doing that in another episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but you Promo. know, back back when this was happening, it wasn't mental health wasn't a thing. True. And true. it was when you had like epilepsy or something like that, you were then sort of shunned. Right, sort yeah, of thing. True, and they just leave even you, though yeah. epilepsy is not like mental health. Yeah, but they just blame it on yeah. something that wasn't. Yeah. Right. Okay. In mm. May of 1941, there was a nationwide request to call in all 303 Winchester rifles to be used by military personnel. Oh my lord! In the Second World War, I didn't stop at the comma. <laughs> <laughs> when Stan was approached by Constable Ted Best, known as Teddy. No. Oh. <laughs> when Stan was approached by Constable Edward Mark Best, known as Ted Best, for his 303, Stan advised that he did not have it and it had been stolen. Mm. At this point, Stan raised with the police his suspicions he and his wife had of the neighbours poisoning the, their cattle. Right. This was not true. It was from lack of hygiene in the milking shed and due to the wet, wet season, his cattle had not been fed properly. Right, okay. But in his head, he's kind of got that, like, he, oh, it's the neighbours doing it, it's definitely not me. So he's just in denial, well, not in denial, but, like, just, he doesn't know that yeah. it's his fault. Yeah, of, shifting yeah. the yeah. blame yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Well, part of, apart from it makes him more dangerous, though, because he fully thinks he's right. Yeah. 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 But, you know, he most probably didn't realize it was the unhygienicness of yeah. the cow shoes yeah, and stuff exactly. like that yeah and obviously not realizing that that had happened yeah um just blames. yes yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> okay when ted returned once again for the firearm which stan had been seen with since the last encounter stan advised ted he would have to prosecute him before he would get it and inspector and Greymouth, receiving Ted's report, prosecuted Stan for not handing over his firearm. Fair enough, yeah. Upon returning on the 15th of July, 1941, Stan advised Ted that he would hand over his firearm if the prosecution was dropped. The gun was finally handed over on this date. The prosecution was unable to be dropped as he had been summoned to court. Right. 
Dan and his wife still had a further assortment of firearms. Wait, so is this like a wife, wife-husband thing? You'll get to that. You'll yeah, we'll get, get to, to that, that next. Yeah. Yeah, no. This is interesting. <clears throat> when Ted Best visited in June, he ascertained that Stan is generally considered locally to be going mental. At this time, Stan began threatening and abusing passing neighbours, even though I've just said that, but it got worse, mm. as he still believed they were poisoning his cows. His reaction to his neighbours was getting increasingly worse. As time went on, Stan and his wife were pre- practicing target shooting from the back of their home in the middle of the night. Ooh. Stan was said to be an expert marksman. Mm. Stan's neighbour, Anka Mazden, approached Ted Best as Stan was continuing to accuse Anka of poisoning his cattle. Ted decided not to respond to give Stan time to cool down. October 8th, 1941, Stan confronted Anka with a rifle. Ted called and paid a visit to Stan, but when he but left when he was welcomed with two rifles pointed at him from windows. Jeez, <laughs> screw that. Nut piece out. <laughs> Ted left and returned with Sergeant William Cooper, Constable Frederick Jordan, and Percival Percy Tullock. Cooper and Ted approached Dan to gain the rest of his firearms due to the risk he was to the community. When Cooper and Ted entered the home, they found themselves with guns pointed at them from behind and in front. And and in front. Oh, so there's like one people. on either side. Okay, I was yeah, like, yeah, there's two people. So my brain is not working. <laughs> <laughs> like four people. <laughs> <laughs> when Cooper reached to disarm Stan, shots were fired, hitting and injuring Cooper and Ted. Jordan and Tullock ran into the home to help. They were both shot dead with one bullet upon entering the home. Jeez. Cooper, who was badly wounded, attempted to leave to get help. He was shot dead on the path at the, at the front of the house. Oh. Ted was shot once more after he had tried to persuade Stan to call for a doctor as Constable Jordan might live if he received immediate medical attention. Stan may have made the call, but it was too late. Ted had been shot twice, but was still alive. A field instructor from the Canterbury Education Board, George Ridley, and a fellow neighbour who was armed, attempted to enter the property to help the wounded. Stan shot and wounded George while disarming the other man and taking his gun. Stan fled into the farm of the West Coast Bush, which began New Zealand's largest manhunt. Jeez. Far out. That's on that's <clears> insane, <throat> honestly. Especially like on in Greymouth, like on the West Coast, which is freaking tiny anyway, like currently. Like imagine what, seventy, eighty years ago. Mm. How small it was and then it's the biggest manhunt. Actually I think it was a wee bit bigger because um like there was a hotel the Langford Hotel was down in Canary or Cockatai, one of them. Yeah. There's still a hotel down there, but I don't think it was... It's not as big now as once it was. Yeah. What it once was. Oh, okay. Interesting. Interesting, yeah. Um, could be wrong, though. Don't yeah. quote me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Dot was held at the post office with their two children for their safety. The community and surrounding areas sent their men to stay at the community hall across the road from Stan and Dot's house to keep watch. They stationed three men from the home guard in the home, Mako Hager, Colin Howitt and Gregory Hutchison. (laughs) Commissioner of Police Dennis Cumming led the pursuit in the manhunt. More than 100 New Zealand police and several hundred New Zealand army and home guard personnel searched the area for Stan for 12 days with orders to shoot on sight if they found him armed. They established a password so they would know how to tell the difference between Stan and the others. The password was Hokitaka. Nice. Very original. (laughs) Very original. (laughs) Okay, so you may ask, what is a home guard? The home guard was an armed citizen metallia supporting the British Army during the Second World War. Right, October 9th. 1941, day two. Stan's dog appears to be following a shadowy figure around the house. The men suspect it's just another guardsman. They call for the password. A reply comes as, Stan Graham. Oh. Hutchison is hit first by Stan's bullet. Oh, so he shoots again. So it wasn't even just, oh my God. Neighbouring farmer, Maxie Colston, come to assist. Between the road and the house is an exposed 30 metre path. 
Maxie makes it to the house but is shot. He manages to get inside but bleeds to death in one night. Oh, far out. Yeah. Hokitika Home Guard Commander um, Amiri King makes it to the house and spots Graham crouching outside. He fires and the bullet hits Stan in the shoulder. Stan manages to get another escape. October 10th, day 3. Stan returns again that night, resulting in being shot through the thumb and wrist. Both, Graham, both of Graham's Winchester rifles and 800 rounds of ammunition were discovered. Um, the ammunition side of things, like 800 rounds, I also saw another source that was like 700, approximately 700 rounds. So. Yeah, so just a roundabout. Yeah, roundabout, yeah. give or take. Yeah, still a lot. <clears throat> yeah. Blood was discovered on one of the rifles from his wounds. Both of um, Stan's Winchester rifles and 800 rounds of ammunition were discovered. Blood was discovered on one of the rifles from his wounds. In the next few days, Stan's blood-soaked shirt and the three hundred three rifle he had stolen earlier were, were recovered. Reinforcements were called in and a spotter plane. From this point on, Stan was sighted numerous times by home, guard, home guardsmen and neighbours on at least three occasions, which was fired upon, while it, which he was fired upon, whilst attempting to return to his home or simply walking in its vicinity. On at least two occasions, cattle on the nearby farms were found slashed or shot, and on at least one occasion, a dead heifer was found with meat taken from it. Mm. I mean, fair enough, a man's got to eat. Yeah. 11th of October, day four. Ted Best passes away due to his injuries in hospital. Mm. A wee bit of a jump, but... It's it's day 10, eh? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, 17th of October, day 10. A farmhouse belonging to Henry... Brocott, a childhood friend of Stan's, was broken into and food was taken. 20th of October, day 13. The police were positioned around the Graham home, expecting Stan to return. An injured Stan was seen and shot by Auckland Constable James Darcy Quirk with a 303 rifle as he crawled through the patch of scrub. There was also an article saying that he was shot while climbing over a fence, but... Mm. Um, you know, I can't, Yeah. I, I can't, you know, go and ask him. So. <laughs> um, Damn it. <laughs> uh, his shoulder and hand were gangrenous and swollen. He would have suffered for the, with this for several days. Mm. They say his hand was the size of a um, baseball glove. Oh, jeez. Because of the wound that went in, <laughs> in at the thumb and out through the wrist. Oh, and it was, oh, ooh. Yeah. <clears throat> Ow, that, no, that sounds painful. Yeah. Screw that. I mean, uh, he deserved it, but um, <laughs> like, debatable. There's a bit more than well, that. Well, yeah, there's a wee bit more than he deserved <laughs> it, but um, he died the following morning at approximately 5.25am at Westland Hospital, Hokitika, with his wife by his side. He was able to hide in an old tree stump on the top of the neighbouring farms throughout the manhunt. Going back to that, though, like, that's just like a basically New Zealand in a nutshell like even though he's done all that kind of stuff all that awful stuff he was still able to have like his wife next to him when he died yeah in the movie um I don't know how accurate the movie is I talk about that very soon but um in the movie what happens is he is lying in the hospital bed he's surrounded by cops obviously Mm. she walks in He pretends to be more buggered than he actually is and says to her along the lines of go home or Mm -hmm. something. And she scones off saying, you know, is that all you've got to say to me? And then he pretends to die. She leaves. Yeah. And then he asks the cops, is she gone? Yeah. And then talks normally to them and then he passes away. (laughs) But, yeah, it's hard to know what actually happened when you're... I don't have the exact. Yeah. That's weird as well, because, like, she, like, they had two, you know, when you said back then, he had two guns pointed at them. So yep. she's she's just walking free, really, even though she was part of the... Yeah. The team. Yeah. yeah. The team. The team. <laughs> That's the wrong word to say. Okay, but... <laughs> right. Yeah. The Graham home was burned to ground burned to the ground shortly after the event and no one was ever held accountable for this Mm. two seconds 
Okay, so this is the coroner's report. It's not the full report because it goes into the sizes of the holes and the exit wounds and entry wounds. This is a quick overlook of it. So this is a report of Basil Wilson associated with Robert Atkin. Post-mortem examination held at the Westland Hospital Mortuary on the 21st of October, 1941. Three gunshot wound tracks found on the body. Number one entry wound at the base of the left thumb and palm. Exit wound at the back of the wrist containing splintered bone. Base of thumb and carpal joint were fractured. Wound was very inflamed and swollen, full of pus and appeared to be several days old. No bullet fragments found. Entry wound two. Uh, entrance wound situated over the right scalpel below the right shoulder. The muscles of the shoulder blade were based badly lacerated and the lower scalpler was torn away. Yep. <laughs> the wound was inflamed and contained much pus. This wound was several days old. Mm. Two pieces of bullet lead and one piece of bullet casing were found in the muscle. Entrance wound number three. Situated in the left mid axillary line. This track then continued through the diaphragm, colon, stomach and liver, causing extensive lacerations to these organs. From this wound, the bullet fragment and cartridge casing as a seat were removed. Cartridge casing found inside the abdomen. The pieces of bullet were found in a small puncture wound on the right side of the forehead under the skin. This wound contained pus and was several days old and was consistent with that which would be caused by a stray piece of lead from such a wound as wound one in the left wrist. General condition of organs, heart, lung, brain and abdominal organs apart from the injuries were normal and healthy. Cause of death, hemorrhage and shock from extensive internal abdo abdominal injuries due to the gunshot wound. So that is the coroner's report. That's um, just in Google Images. Just in Google Images? The report, not, oh. not the not the wounds. <laughs> holy, holy moly. <laughs> yeah, you can just Google it and it brings up the coroner's report. Oh, weird. I know. <laughs> okay, about the people who passed in order. Percival Campbell Tullich, born 9th of October 1906, eldest of eight, was shot and killed a day before his birthday. A day before his birthday. Yeah. Oh, that sucks. William Cooper, born New Townards Island around 1898, married in 1921 to Sarah Murdoch. William was sergeant of the Hokitika Police. Frederick William Jordan, born 1916, joined the police force in 1937 and was stationed in Hokitika. He was also married in 1937 to Kathleen Lomas. Gregory George Thomas Hutchison, born 1911, married 1934 to Ruby Dimick, member of the Canary Home Guard. He was not her. Richard John Maxton Colston, Maxie, born 1915, son of Hokitika dentist. Married in 1938 to Corel Mitchell. Passed away October 9, 1941. Neighbouring farm to Stan and Dot. Neighbouring farmer to Stan and Dot. Edward Mark Best, known as Ted, was born in 1998. He was born in... 1898. <laughs> 1899. Oh, <laughs> we're completely wrong. He was born in Annadale to a farmer and had three siblings. At the age of 21, he joined the police force. Mid-1920, he re relocated to the West Coast, where he met his wife, Caroline Havel, who was from Ahara Valley. They were married in 1930 in an area near his police house in Canary. Ted served 20 years in the police force, ranking constable. He was also a member of the Freemasonry Society. He was survived by a wife and two daughters who were aged nine and four when he passed. Mm, that's sad. Yeah. 
It was said that Ted handled his community problems at a personal level, making him popular in the community and an effective police constable. Mm. George Ridley was born in 1887 in Sydney, Australia. George and his wife, Eva Gunn, were married in 1915 in New Zealand. They had a baby girl in 1917. George was employed as a government agriculture inspector and instructor. At the time of 1932, George and his wife were living in Timaru. On the 8th of the 10th, 1941, George accompanied police to the farm of Stan Graham. It was understood that Stan wasn't caring for his cattle very well and it was likely that George was going to find out what was going on and see if he could help the volatile situation between Stan and his neighbours and to see if he could help Stan with the condition of his cattle. George got caught in the crossfire between Stan and the police. He finally passed due to his injuries on the 19th of the 3rd, 1943 in Hokitaka Hospital. His death was ruled the seventh, seventh death caused by Stan. Seven. So what, that's two years later. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so one, one of the theories to this, you know, what happened in the lead up to it is, I've got three theories, bear with me. Um, so the first one is mental health. So an Auckland University of Technology law professor Warren Brooksbank described Stan as, from all accounts, he was also something of a social isolate and had plenty of opportunity to reflect on his perceived injustices and how he might address them. Mm. Warren said that an interesting comparison might be with the Aramoana killer, David Gray, mm. who also became very isolated and killed 13 people after a verbal dispute with his neighbours. In each case, the offenders appeared to be driven by a deep rage, no doubt fed from the same sense of injustice they had been or were experiencing. In Stan's case, this appears to have developed into real paranoid delusions as his mental state began to deteriorate and his suspicions began to escalate. Like David Gray, I imagine Stan, despite his apparent fearlessness, was a pretty fragile personality perhaps a, pro a product of his increased isolation and sense of rejection did not take much to trigger explo an explosion into a violent rage. Okay, so that was um, Warren Brooksbank. And this is also a question that he had. If Stan survived the police confrontation and had been tried for the murders, would he been able to be tried as a successful defense of insanity? Well, he, that makes sense though, because like he, based on what you said, based on that whole thing that happened, he did have quite a few mental health issues that just, well, the society hadn't really considered mental health to be like, an issue. like you said, hadn't yeah. really considered that. So I, that could stand, but also like, I don't know. I don't know. With the paranoid delusion, so... Like you said, though, um, the fact that he thought he was correct yeah. would have been, like, a dangerous yeah. point because of the paranoia. Yeah. Um, the next theory. Dot fired the first shot. Well, yeah, and then he's just backing her up, I guess, and then... Yeah. Okay, so yeah, but I still oh going back to that, I still don't understand. She there's nothing really about her like he dies and everything, but she just gets away with it. It's like <laughs> it is unknown what events unravelled in the shooting. Only the people in the home at the time of the incident could tell us this. In the 1981 movie Bad Blood, shows Doc firing a shot at Ted Best and hitting him in the hand. The potential of this was never explored by the coroner. And I also can't find the report. A 22 cartridge was found by the police the following day under the front doorstep where it may or may not have been kicked. Hmm. My issue with that, though, is they were practice shooting around the house. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that could be from that. Yeah. But the movie states Ted Best was shot with a 22. 
if the 22 was shot by Stan, it would mean that he would have had to change guns in the middle of shooting. But that could also be, like, the whole ammo thing as well. Like, maybe, like, he ran out of ammo and he's like, nah, I want to go use this other gun or something. So that kind of makes sense. You could see both ways. I mean, there was only one shot of the 22, though. Oh, okay. Oh. And it wasn't the first shot. The first shot was... Well, uh, the sergeant right. when he tried to disarm Stan. Right. Okay. So yeah. No. Well, there you go. Then she. Okay. Um... Hold on. <laughs> hold on. Um. Best stated after being taken to the hospital that Dorothy was between her husband and the police. Stan ordered them out of the house, pushing her after them. Um. Did she shoot to protect her husband? Was she a mother desperate to protect her children? Or did she even fire a shot at all? Mm. It is also recorded that Stan could have been led astray by his wife, who was saying, shoot him, Stan. Mm. Arthur Howard, the author of Manhunt, says that, says he has a source who states that Ted Best confirmed he was shot by Dot. Arthur states the source is impeccable. It had been recorded that Dorothy's mental state was very similar to that of her husband's. Dorothy passed away at the age of 75 in Christchurch. Theory three. Right, um, this one's going to be a wee bit controversial. Um, and I'm not going to go overly into this because of how hit and miss this is going to be. But um, my opinion is not relevant in this. So um, theory three. The police were the instigation of the events. So they were the cause of the events. Ah, oh, okay. Being, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Kinda, I guess. <laughs> so I'm not gonna go too in depth into this as it's quite controversial. Yeah. But um this is just I've just seen some people saying this and I've read some stuff about this. Okay, so it's not much of a theory, but if Stan had not been approached by the police to have his guns confiscated, this would not this event would not have happened. Yeah. So I've seen a comment saying they drove him to do what he did on a local page. Mm. <laughs> the fact around this though is Stan was suffering and he believed that his neighbours were poisoning his cattle. And he was pointing guns at his neighbours and already. threatening to shoot them. Yeah, he was already doing it with the police. Camera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would this event not have happened if the police hadn't approached Stan? Maybe. Mm. Was there potential for him to shoot his neighbours on the fact that he thought they were poisoning his cows? Yeah. 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 The police were doing what they, what they at the time thought was right well i reckon it's still right as well to be honest but yeah it can, yeah, it could yeah. Have gone either way yeah the police were doing what they at the time would have thought as right taking away the guns that he was threatening his neighbors with fair mm -hmm. yes. yeah yeah if they handled this a different way this may not have happened but hindsight this event did change the way the police policed the police museum in Porirua which holds Stan's 1895 Winchester rifle, wanted sign and a cloth-covered notebook from Constable Charles Reardon, says that although, although Constable Quirk had acted under instruction from his supervisors to shoot if Stan was armed, he was condemned by the public. This influenced the police response to armed offenders for the next two decades. Mm. So, And so on direct result, Police were reluctant to shoot armed offenders with tragic consequences. Stan didn't shoot anybody that wasn't on his property. True. Mm. Coincidence? Maybe. Yeah. Fact? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> fact, yeah. Um, so this is a letter written nine days before the event by Stan to his friend called Stan. Oh. Um, <laughs> it shows us a little bit of who the man Stan was before the event. Mm. Okay, um, I do not have all of the words because it is in cursive handwriting and I had to request my mother's assistance to decipher. <laughs> so, 
So just bear with me. <laughs> Dear Stan, just a few lines to see if you are still fine and doing, as I have not heard from you for some time. However, something, you are just emerging from winter. We have, we are having a busy time at present with our cows. They have had a strange sickness we could not understand, but are beginning to see the two causes of it now. Two families, Mr. Cooper and the other neighbor are still here. Have you done any shooting lately? I intend to do some later on probably amongst the deer, which reminds me, I must try out a rifle on a target sometime, sometime on Preston's trees. Though Shane has had a few shots with it and it shot perfect. Bob Preston is still kicking about, something, something, etc. How is Ethel? How is your dog? The bitch one we have here is a great pet. Think probably more affectionate than the other breeds, but I do not know how the dogs would be. Well, for the present, cheerio. I remain yours truly, S.E.G. Graham. Mm. So, you know, it's nine days before the event. So, you know, he was still suspicious about his cows, but yeah. Yeah. He, he's a man, nonetheless. Yeah. Just a very sick man. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to end on the memorial. So, on the 8th of October 2004, they unveiled the memorial for the seven murdered by Eric Stanley George. Graham. Wait, that was in 2004? Yep. Oh. This is a large memorial boulder which each victim is named on the memorial with a commemorative bronze plaque. In the middle of the border, in the middle of the boulder, is a round hole which you can see the landscape beyond, with text underneath the hole explaining the significance. The text is an extract from a policeman's prayer found in the possession of Constable Tullock. This window, <coughs> which is, this window presents a view from the gate down the path 25 metres distance from the house in Enviros, where the victims of this incident were slain. Let me look into the face of death with unblinking eyes and with no sense of fear. Teach me to realise that there are prowling human wolves ever ready to devour the innocent. That there are depraved creatures cast in commonly human mould, to, hu to whom murder is but an incident. Yes. Mm, that's, yeah. There's the burial being, well, the memorial being in 2004, <laughs> years after yeah. that happened. Yeah. 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 So it's got the the seven names of the people who were killed. Mm. We will upload a picture to our Instagram when we finally get this ball rolling. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. And we will also upload some more pictures just to yeah. illustrate some more of the story and show a bit of perspective. Exactly. Also to our other social medias, which I'm not 100% sure what are. Yeah. No. But yeah. It was really interesting, actually, yeah. I had no idea about anything about that case. And I'm from New Zealand, so <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, it's such an old case, though, so it's not, like, common knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, no, very old case, but cool they did the memorial anyway. Yeah, I would have liked to gain access to the Hokitika Library to do some more research, but... Yeah. Um, that is only open by appointment, and I sent them an email, but haven't heard anything back, so... Yeah, and we'll do a review, like, later, later on, when we actually get the hang of this podcast thing, eh? <laughs> yes. Do a go over things again. Nah, awesome. Yeah. So, Andy's gonna do one next whenever and then we will carry on doing podcasts but if you have any suggestions on what we should do a podcast on please send us an email i don't know our email off the top of my head is but yet. it'll be in our little blurby thing <laughs> yeah it'll be in the show notes so if you can check a subject line in there saying saying like topic for podcast and yeah then go into a little bit of detail and where you got your information from and then if what what you really wanted us to include or what you wanted us to focus on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So that's us and thank we'll you. see you next time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this was 
and Aiden. <laughs> and Isla. And, and Chris are? as well. <laughs> and, and what are we? Send us to Dynasty. dynasty. <laughs>